we cause more of our anxiety, our low self-esteem and self-doubt than anyone else. And that's what I realized when I was in Milan two months ago and I listened to Meta on stage to her talk about stage fright. So I'm very excited that she's here with us today, ready to share her experience and tips and strategies that helped her also empower other people and herself in her daily life and business. Welcome, Meta. You're glowing today. It's so nice to have you here. And I'm going to ask, of course, first, please tell us your story and how did you get into this topic of mastering self-talk and overcoming with self-limitations? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's lovely. Um, yes, I am, I am. Well, first of all, I'm a woman. I'm a woman entrepreneur. Uh, and I'm also a mother who likes to let's say, uh, be a positive influence, especially on my daughter, you know, because she's a woman growing up in this um, a bit more patriarchy world, I guess, in some sense. Still uh, glass ceilings everywhere, I guess. Um, I am, I, I started working in marketing, actually, this is when I opened my first company, but uh, I was very in the shadows. I wasn't really bringing myself forward as much as I needed to, to really be prom promoting my business and myself and my service and my knowledge and everything. Uh, so um, at one point I crashed, I had this burnout and I had to stop. And it was at that point when I uh, found out about the Public Speaking Academy in London and I, I just got really wow, this is something that I would really love to have for me, for my life. I thought if I had the courage and the, 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 the congruency, you know, the clarity of thought and, and, and emotion to stand in front of just thousands of people and not have my knees shake, not just one bit, that would be amazing. And I really wanted that. So I started training public speaking and 10 years fast forward. Today, I'm a professional speaker coach. Uh, and with this, in the 10 years of my journey, I actually worked a lot and, and studied and uh, researched a lot about stage fright and also about imposter syndrome and about inner dialogues and things like that, that actually accumulate our own disbelief in ourselves and, you know, create those doubts and insecurities that we have uh, that come out even more intensely uh, in these contextual situations when we can't really control conversations. Like one-on-one -on -one is, is easier, but one-on-one a thousand is much different. And, you know, especially if you're on social media, you're talking to people who can't see them. They're the invisible enemy. <laughs> you know, so they're this invisible threat. Um, and uh, I, I was really interested in this because, you know, especially working in London, I, I came across a lot of people who were, you know, had MBAs and were so educated, were so wonderful, wonderful people, and just didn't believe in themselves. And had their voices shake so much when they got the microphone and they were just, you know, blushing and shaking. And, and then you had those other, you know, egomaniacs who were just like, they just thought they knew everything. And they really didn't. They didn't have all those experiences, but they just didn't care. They're like, yeah, I'm here. I'm great. And I, what, what, what creates this difference? You know, this was really intriguing to me. And then we started researching this. And today I help a lot of women entrepreneurs and uh, also men uh, deal with uh, empowerment, I guess. That would be the, the closest word to just nail it, to say, you know, to, to have your power, own your power, uh, your stories, uh, your life, and know who you are, what you are, what you're about, and really be okay with that. I really love the, like listening to your stories reminded me of my own time in London because actually when I was there I was also doing some performance studies and I was like part of the program was also performing in a the theater and I just remember going on the stage it was like you know the rows uh, going up and the further away the darker they got so you couldn't see it but like infinite audience and we were there on the stage and whenever I think back to this experience I'm always so grateful that my role was to play a hyperventilating intern of a weather forecast because this was like perfectly matching my experiences. But, you know, thinking back to like stage fright and this, you know, the difference between people, like, right? Some people go there and they like nail it and other people have this 
something that blocks them. So like in your experience, what are some of these common, you know, uh, obstacles with uh, self-talk or some beliefs that limit us in this kind of situations? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe that it's about accepting yourself and, you know, um, the, in my experience, there's a lot of, let's say, a difference to how you position yourself in terms of to other people. You know, you, you only know, you know everything about yourself. You know what you're good at and you also know where you're failing. And you, there's room for improvement, let's call it like that, okay? Everybody has room for improvement. Everybody wants to be a better person to some extent in their life or have a better life or, you know, something that we are improving all the time. And then with other people, we just see the surface. We don't really see what's in the core. We don't really know them. Uh, but on the surface, things look pretty awesome. You know, like, so our brains kind of really just make this very easy calculation. Surface perfect, they must have perfect lives. You know, they must have everything great. No pain, no problem, no, no history even. Like when I work with clients, you know, even just the other day, uh, we were working, uh, I have this technique called humanizing the audience, especially the VIPs in the audience, you know, people who you most want to impress. Like, let's say you have the CEO and uh, you believe like, oh, he, he's not going to be my friend or, you know, that he, he needs to, uh, he's a really tough guy or a tough woman. And uh, we don't really see them as human beings. We don't see their pain, their struggles, their growing up, mm -hmm. you know, how they even, uh, what, what sort of problems they faced in their life. So we don't tend to kind of be empathetic to them, you know, and um, mm -hmm. I think this is most important in that sense that um, that we kind of understand that everybody's going through the same obstacles and opportunities that we are, you know, they're, they have the same, let's say, I, I like to say they cried in the past and they will cry in the future as well, just as we will cry and once have cried. And, uh, and also they were happy and joyful at one point in time and they will again be happy and joyful at one other point in time you know in the future so we kind of are very similar in terms of you know what uh the hum human aspect of of our individuality is um you know i think um you were you were talking about these limitations and uh limiting beliefs and um you know this is an interesting point that i'd also like to share because working with rhetorics and public speaking and in communication in general, I always believe that limiting beliefs are something that are that is buried deep, deep, deep down in our psyche and it's hard to reach. But working more with uh, with this with words, basically the power of words, I realize that everything we say, Every word we use throughout the day, every minute of the day, even if it's not spoken out loud, if it's just in our own mind, you know, our inner dialogue, is forming a belief. The sentence is basically a belief that has formed out of words. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to be really mindful of basically everything we say, because our brain has this back loop. You know, we say it and we again hear it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of funny. You know, we just said it, but we also heard it. And that kind of makes it, you know, we kind of, you know, we carve it in stone. The more often we say some things, the more, the more impactful it becomes. So it's really, really, really important that we are really mindful of the words we are using uh, and the sentences we're forming and the stories we're creating with uh, with these tools, which are words, so that they are more optimistic and positive. They have an open orientation, which actually means that they have there's possibility for improvement. It's not like, you know, I'm never going to win at this. I'm never going to achieve this. It, you know, it's more like I'm going to have to really try uh, and work hard and put a lot of effort in if I want to achieve this. So you don't have to say it's easy, but you do have to be mindful that it's going towards the future and that it's open. So in a way, everything you say is a belief. Is it limiting you? Well, that's about the context. You know, that's about how you framed it. Mm -hmm. So from what I'm hearing is to be mindful, like 
I, I've heard like two things just to summarize a little bit. So the first thing is to realize, well, like in case we are on stage or we need to talk in front of the audience, to realize the human side of everybody, right? With emotions and oh, yeah. And the mm-hmm. second part was about now I was just so stuck in the second first part. The second part was about thinking more into the future when we say things to to open it up a little bit, right? Not to have a limit that I would like believe it's like a closed door, like I can't do it or it's not for me or I suck or whatever, but just to try to formulate it in a way that gives some kind of leave some way open, right? Like I cannot do it yet or um, I could do it, uh, but it takes quite some work, but I can get there. Something like that, humans. Well, if you just put it in the context of a situation, if you are performing on stage and you have the audience there, you know, mm-hmm. what are you thinking in these five minutes before going on stage? Are you thinking, oh, my presentation is not good enough? Uh, or are you actually focusing on um, the audience saying, you know, um, I hope the points in my presentation help them deal with their situation? Mm. And really focusing on their situation, saying, you know, what, wh- where are they exactly in life right now? And even if they look super cool on the surface and smiling and, you know, the best dressed people you've ever seen, Mm. that does not mean that they do not have issues in their life or some sort of struggle. If you were to talk to each and every one of them, I bet you would discover something that is not a good fit in their lives that they might have, I don't know, relationship problems. Maybe they they have some disease. Maybe they... uh, uh, they can they can they have financial issues that you know it, people have issues and we don't tend to go that far into their um their the reality of them you know we just tend to stay on the surface and say like oh you're fine you know you just look great you must be okay mm-hmm. <laughs> with me it's different you know with me it's with us personally we know everything about ourselves so the focus needs to go elsewhere in that sense. But if, you know, if I'm talking about, if I say like, I don't like my presentation, that is a limiting belief. You know, I need to say, I, I would prefer to restructure to, you know, um, I have worked really hard to make this presentation uh, be the best fit for who I think I'm talking to, or, you know, just kind of try to make it more positive and open. Mm. With my clients, I write this thing down. We we tend to uh, catch limiting beliefs, catch intrusive thoughts, mm-hmm. uh, negative thoughts that just fly, you know, through our brain at some point in during the day. And we write them down and then we look at them and like, hmm, you know, what is the meaning of this? Well, can I have the same meaning, but with more positive, open, future oriented mm-hmm. uh you know, way of framing this. Mm-hmm. And there's always a better way of framing this. And I'm I'm not really talking about just being happy, happy. What mm-hmm. I'm talking about is real work with words that that fit together in a sense that actually keep, you know, give you not a limitation on your belief, but rather a possibility. Mm-hmm. Making sense. So the energy, you know, like you just feel the energy in the word, limitation, possibility. That, it, it just there's this vibe to it and so I really like to you know keep to the positive vibe of the words oh absolutely the, the words are so powerful it always amazes me how not not quickly but like how um you know it's like if, if something really turns quickly if you just start with that instead of trying to I don't know transform your life in any other way by I think if you if you had two ways to transform your life and one of them would be to write down a belief that might be limiting you and then try to reformulate it in the way you mentioned and the other one just pay 5,000 euro flight to United States for some coaching retreat and get you know shouted at by some motivational coach I feel like the first way is so undervalued and so powerful it's really really good but it's really happy that to hear that you also like you know use it and that you share it here yeah what you said is really important because it's okay to go to a retreat and uh, work with some coaches but then again they do not have the um, do not give them the power to transform your life you know like they can show you the door but then you have to go to the door and understanding your your rhetorics 
and in your the words, the lexical, you know, part of um, of your self talk and of your also, you know, dialogues, everything, the conversations you're having, communication that you're having, uh, that is the walk <laughs> to me. That is how you walk to the towards the door. No, absolutely, and and it's also a very important thing that you mentioned there because before I did uh, the coaching qualifications, I was also thinking like, what are those coaches? And you know, from sports uh, or business environment, we were used to them telling us you should do this, this, and that, and like kind of paving the way for us. But then throughout these qualifications, I realized it's actually the coach is to open up your mind somehow some lockers you have there by asking you some probing questions or using some different words sometimes to name things for you that you couldn't name in a certain way but the work is really on you and if you don't make the steps then you're not gonna move very far whether whether you go to some <laughs> retreat or not <laughs> Mm, maybe like one question that I have now, you know, we had the specific situation where we are in front, like before entering the stage and talking to the different audience, but there are a lot of situations like, you know, job interviews, uh, I don't know, the first date, uh, in a lot of contexts where this negative self-talk limits us. And I, I experienced it also, of course, and I know that it's exactly in the situations this is where you don't think about self-limiting belief, right? Because you get into this loop and like, oh my God, am I good enough? And you start hyperventilating. Do you have some tips or like some, you know, quick um, quick reminders that can be used in these situations? Yeah, it's, um, you know, self-talk I really find very interesting, uh, you know, in, in, in concept and theory. Uh, I feel in my life, you know, prior uh, when I had a lot of doubts and insecurities um, and uh, and anxieties as well, I would believe that this is a part of me that no one sees, that no one, uh, in, that is sort of private, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I can have very bitchy thoughts. <laughs> And you know, be a really be really cruel to myself, and you know, say really negative, uh, devaluating things to myself, like oh, you look so awful, you know, your hair is messy, and ah, you know, that's a, a bad, 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 bad. And I would believe that no one would see this, and then I would walk in front of people, or just go to a coffee, or first date, or something like that, like smiling, like hey, you know, I'm fine, I'm all right, I'm I'm super cool, <laughs> but. When you started training, when I started training public speaking, there's this thing we, we call inner state, right? You know about this, mm -hmm. you know, the, the body, the ethos of the speaker, you know, how you volumize yourself. And this is the first impression, okay? So this is what people people's brains, you know, catch when they first look at you. And for some reason, it's like telepathic. They sort of know, they have this hunch. Mm -hmm. Don't fool them. There's something amiss. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that is all about your thinking, you know, your thinking drives your feeling, your feeling drives your actions and the actions are basically, you know, the feeling is the inner state of the body, how you calibrated yourself, how what the chemistry is on the inside. So that's why it's super important to really have conscious control over your self talk over the dialogue that you have in your mind. And um when I, I there's actually four categories of this of this self talk. So we have like self motivational talk when you're like, yeah, you you can do it. You're gonna it's gonna be awesome. You know, come on, you know, push through motivation and and things like that. And then you have the self criticism. And it you know people say, okay, I'm not gonna criticize myself. I'm just gonna stay in the self motivating box. But that's not actually healthy. You need to have healthy self guidance in the sense of further improvements but the way you deliver that mm. that is important if you deliver it like just imagine you come on stage and you say you all suck you you know nothing if you talk like this to the audience they're just gonna stand up and leave you mm. know if you're on the first date and you say you know that dress doesn't really look good on you and mm. why are you drinking this drink it's not healthy and your eyes are, are you, are you, you know, uh, <laughs> they have bad eyesight or something. Uh, if you start talking like that to the, to your date, they're probably going to get up and leave. 
Mm. But we talk to ourselves like that and we let it, we, we allow ourselves to, to listen to that bullshit. So how you frame the, the self-criticism is basically extremely important. And I like to use the val validation information validation technique, meaning that you always have to first validate, you know, hey, I see that you're really working hard on this. This time it didn't work. Mm. You missed A, B, and C. But I'm pretty sure that if you, you know, put in some extra hours, you're going to figure it out. So it's it really has to be that sa feedback sandwich technique, which in, in the tonality, you know, speakers know about tone of voice. Mm -hmm. In the self-criticism, you have to use the respectful tonality. And also, like, do you respect yourself? Like, do you respect yourself? And then I thought, how would that look like, really? And I ask my clients all the time. Do you, you know, how does self-respect actually physically form? Mm. And it's like, oh, hmm, hmm, I don't know. I don't know really. Well, it's how you talk to yourself. It's the tone of voice. Mm. You know, just think, you know, how you show respect with your body, with your voice, with the words you're using to someone else, you know, someone like your, your mother or your neighbor. So that is the form of respect. So you need to copy paste that in your inner dialogue. And now you have these two, like self-motivation and self-criticism. And then you have the self-orientation and social context. So that means now you have self-orientation. If you figured out how to self-motivate yourself and how to give yourself constructive feedback, then it's very more likely that in self-orientation, which is goal setting for yourself, you will be likely to set yourself higher goals because it will have better support. Is it making sense? Yeah, absolutely. Even if you fail, you will not be so devastatingly cruel to yourself. So you won't fear failure as much because you know you're always going to have your BFF to say, hey, it's fine. Come on, here's a shoulder. We're going to get through this. You know, I got your back. You know, here's my hand. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to imagine sometimes I'm, I'm kind of like this, you know, when I have my self dialogues, I'm always saying to myself, like, I, I got you. You know, I have your, I'm going to hold your hand. I'm, I'm going to hold my own hand. And mm -hmm. that's something I say, it's silly, but often I do hold my own hand. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm scared and, and some things are, are, you know, are scary. And, mm -hmm. and then I like to say, hey, come on, I got you. I'm holding your hand, you know. And um, this is like in a vision, I have this courage in my, in my head. Like there's this person of courage and they're holding the hand of my fear in a sense. This mm -hmm. is the visualization, visualization that I have. Mm -hmm. So you're more likely to have to set higher aims for yourself. And then there's the social uh, uh, construction, mm -hmm. which uh, the representation that you have of yourself socially. Uh, and this is now, you know, now we have number one, number two, number three. We have this figured out, of course, with more motivation, with, be with, with more respect, more self-respect. And with higher um, uh, goals and also less uh, possibility that you will be scrutinizing yourself if you fail, mm -hmm. of course, you have a better representation of yourself as who you are in society. Mm -hmm. And are you valuable? Are you worthy? Is it making sense? Now you, you've come to, to, to place this in a positive frame, okay? Uh, think if everything, if you demotivated yourself daily, if you're always on your case, criticizing yourself if you failed you know and and you really were all yeah i failed again failed again failed again you're just counting your minuses it making sense mm -hmm. of course you're gonna have a bad representation of yourself in society and that's where the pain comes from mm -hmm. and so what you need is to actually mind the inner dialogue so that this thing can actually then be positive and this is where self-dialogue gets really complicated because you know, in our own mind, we tend to be able to, to really fast forward a lot of different versions of reality, how mm -hmm. things are going to play out. Mm -hmm. Say we have a first date or a job interview, mm -hmm. and you, you, you can play the scenarios in your head, how things are going to go. You know, the questions that you will be asked, and then you think of answers, and then you say, like, oh, maybe I'll do it this way or that way. This. So we have the opportunity, the possibility to actually play out like thousands of scripts People don't sleep because of this, mm -hmm. you know, because we run them, we run them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here's where you 
can really make sure that you don't go into the um, catastrophic scenarios, like things that will go bad, thinking like, oh my God, what if I blush? What if I freeze? Mm -hmm. What if I say the wrong thing? But actually just, you know, see a positive image, try to run less scripts for the future because you can't really control what's going to happen, but me, be more present with the person that you're there, you know, focus more on their humanity. Like I said, mm -hmm. you know, and be interested in who they are, like, you know, uh, be more in the moment in the sense of you being interested in who the other person is uh, and not be so focused on your own self, your pluses and your minuses, your shades and your, and your, in, in your light. Um, so yeah, I hope I that wasn't too long right now, but oh, but it, it's extremely interesting and very important points. Like you know, I hope that everybody's gonna remember how much difference the self respect can make, and this analogy of how we talk to others versus how we talk to ourselves, and you know how this could lead to more motivation. As I was listening to you, I had to think about some places in my life that I used to experience where we literally like I was writing my diary and every day I started with some extremely destructive belief with I'm useless I don't know what I'm gonna do with my life I'm tired etc and of course I just reinforced it every single day right so mm -hmm. it, it didn't really serve me well and now when I look at the kind of the person I developed into with a lot of changes and fights and you know uh, therapy even like a lot of things and coaching um mm -hmm. i think it, it really can make a lot of difference so again no, it's really great that you highlighted those things one question that came to my mind i was i was listening to you because we were talking about you know refocusing not from like not focusing on your own like minus points but kind of trying to find the more empowering place and then also about like moving from like the difference between self-motivation and then social context, how you can have more goals, like higher goals once you talk to yourself with respect. Mm -hmm. But then the question that I have is like, so often we focus on others also with our inner dialogue, right? Like what will people think or am I a failure because this person does it better or is further in the journey or um, like we make choices so much based on other people's approval or admiration. And I wanted to ask you how, how to go about that. Like, what can we do to shift this focus to something that matters to us personally? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, the difference between uh, external validation and internal validation. Uh, there is, if you have the imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome people, are very likely to focus a lot on external validation, but then again, they fear external validation because they fear it's not real, mm -hmm. that it some it, it is fraudulent, right? So it means like, oh my God, if someone compliments me, then I must have done something to deceive them into thinking that I'm I'm that good. Uh, so it's kind of it's really um, uh, it's a paradox, really, in that sense. You know, internal validation is extremely important. And then, you know, our, so the way our societies are basically raising us as children, you know, as people, we tend to focus a lot on the external validation, like what grades do you have at school? You know, mm -hmm. how, how are you, which uh, schools did you go to? Or, you know, which company do you work for? Or which brand of T-shirt are you wearing? Or something like that. So those are all externals. Mm -hmm. uh, and these can vary. They can change. Like They can change like this. You can be rich one day. You can be poor the next. You know, one bad financial decision. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, in, in reality, um, internal validation is about understanding your identity, who you are, what you're about, and accepting. You know, I'd like to get back to... Um, to what you said before, because I think this is a really important point. I hope we're not going to get too far off topic, but, um, you know, when you said I'm useless and you wrote that in your, in your di uh, diary, uh, this is uh, about identity. This is who I am mm -hmm. as a person, instead of saying, uh, this is how I feel today. Mm -hmm. So lowering, you know, to, this is what I'm feeling now, not in general, mm -hmm. but just right 
now. And this is not who I am, but this is what I'm feeling. These are, they are separated from me. So that means I can have my identity and in this identity, I can have a certain emotion for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's very important to accept all the emotion. There, there is no emotion that is bad. It's, they're all a bit like compass, you know, like a bit like this, this um, uh, steering uh, navigation system that shows us what we lack, what we need, what our needs and wants are. Um, and it's okay. So if I were to say, I am feeling useless today, I'm feeling feelings of uselessness. And that, that to me now indicates, is there a way that I could feel that I could do something that I could be more of use to someone, right? So what I potentially need to create in my life is more opportunities where I will contribute more. Mm -hmm. Is there a way? So this is the thinking now. So first is acknowledging the feeling, saying, today I'm feeling rather useless, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's okay. You say like, you know, I, I need to do something about that. So what, what would be, let's say, the first steps to doing something about that? So the first steps would be thinking that there is ways of going about this and say, you know, I would like to do something to be more of use. Mm -hmm. What can I do? You know, perhaps I can call my sister and ask if she needs some help. Perhaps I could, you know, call my mother and ask if perhaps I can volunteer. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I could do some something, you know, with a group of friends or something like that. Um, I could be more of use. Um, and then, you know, just have this little little by little action steps that kind of help you get um uh, they they to help you change this emotion. Is it making sense? Mm -hmm. And now you go back to that, and then with the same belief that you wrote down, like I'm feeling useless. Um, and just the insertion of the feeling like this, not I am this, but this mm -hmm. is how I'm feeling. And then you you say, okay, so this is how I was feeling. And I was doing this and this and this about that. Is it making sense? So this is in a way how I go about uh, understanding the lexical principles of um, how to change you know, in a dialogues in that sense. That's I hope this so, yeah, <laughs> we kind of went off topic a little bit. <laughs> no, that was really good because actually, you know, my la last video that I released yesterday was also about like how we identify too much with our emotions and how it can prevent us from really reaching some extraordinary things in life. And mm -hmm. uh, th this was exactly like one thought that I had with this, you know, how we claim emotions like I am angry, I am disappointed. And what you just said perfectly complements what, what I mentioned there in the other video. But to, to use the time I have with you, maybe just uh -huh. up, you can you could uh, think of like what would be like the, something that you would want everybody to remember for the for the year to come, for the future that we have. Because your business is called Shaping Future Voices. And I'm gonna ask yeah. you that as well. But like something that you would like uh, the audience to remember from this conversation or take with them going forward uh yeah um well i guess the story um that i would most like to share and i think that um the, the thing that i've learned the most uh, in the 10 years of working with speakers and being a public speaker myself um and uh is actually very much about how we are not really visible as much as we'd like to think you know, we tend to kind of compare and compete with people and uh, we tend to think like, oh my God, is everybody watching my social media video? What are they thinking about me? You know, mm -hmm. uh, they're not really thinking about you. No one's thinking about you. Uh, it, it's crazy. You know, I, uh, we tend to give ourselves too much focus. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in reality, it's about the other guy, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's about waking up in the morning thinking, how can I serve society today? What do, what do I have to contribute? What mm -hmm. can I create to contribute? And not really think about so much, you know, like how do I, are they seeing me, 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 me. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you know, everybody is focused on their own lives. Everybody's focused on, on themselves. Uh, and uh, there's a story that I really, really love that has helped change my life, really. Uh, it's a story from the book, The Great Magic from Elizabeth Gilbert. 
And um, she's talking about this woman she met. She was 70 years old and she was full of life, so vibrant, so energetic, you know, constantly going out, taking surfing classes at the age of 70. Hello. Uh, you know, not your common grandma, you would say. <laughs> And, and so she was so intrigued by her. She said, I have to ask you, you know, what, what's with you? How come you're so different? You know, what's the story behind this, this energy of yours? And she said, you know what? When I was 20, I cared so much about what other people are thinking about me. And I didn't dare to, to, to take a class or to, to dress a certain way or to speak a certain thing because I feared what will people say. And I wanted to be liked and I wanted to please and I wanted to be a part of this community. I wanted to belong. And I feared that if I you know, do something out of the box that then you know, I will not be accepted. So I did everything that I thought that I should so that I would belong. But I hated how things were. You know, I didn't get to live myself. Mm. So I was frustrated. And so by the end of, of 40, when I was 40 years old, I was thinking, oh, enough already. I can't care less about what other people think. I don't give up what other people think. I'm just going to, you know, be really angry <laughs> about this and just going to live my life and do it the way I wanted to do it. But then she realized, you know what? Something was still missing. I was being myself, but angrily. Uh, I was, in a way, a rebel against everybody else. I was rebelling. I didn't like them. I was like pushing them away because, you know, I don't care what you think. Just talk to the hand. I don't want to have a relationship with you. Just leave me alone. And by the age of 60, she said, she finally realized, oh my God, no one ever, ever was thinking about me at all. They were always thinking about themselves, like, like you were. Like if we roll back this story, this means, you know, everybody at the age of 20 is really preoccupied with themselves. Mm. So like you were, and I was, and everybody is. So that means everybody's in their own head, thinking about their own little inner dialogue. Is it making sense? Mm -hmm. So now we're 40, and we kind of don't care what other people think. But really, what do we think? Do we know that? Do we care about that? Mm -hmm. And by the age of 60, you realize that you can be anyone, you can do anything. Not a it's quite possible people don't really notice as much as you think they do. So for Shaping Future Voices, I publish pretty much one video per day. And I was so fearful about that in the past. I was thinking like, oh my God, if I, if I publish so much, people are going to get you know sick of me. They're going to say like, oh, Mita, she's constantly publishing. You know, we just want to not have hide Mita for 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but in reality, they don't notice as much. You know, it, it, they, they maybe see one video per month or two that they would notice because it's not, you know, constantly. They're not on Meet Meta Life TV all the time. They're in their own life. And there's a lot of content around that, you know. So just every now and then I pop up. Um, but it is that the reason I'm saying this is because you create what you want to create, what, where you want to create it, how much you want to create of it, and then just be bold enough to really put it in front of people so that it can help someone. And from the responsibility of that, you are contributing and creating something and not be worried about what the, you know, lashback is going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, if for me, I tend to really believe in this, find your tribe. You know, when someone is not respectful to me, they, they don't have to like my content. God, no. No one has to like me or my content or anything like that, but they do have to respect me. That is the ground rule. You know, as soon as you have self-respect, if someone is talking to you with a disrespectful tone of voice, 
thank you very much for your opinion. We don't need to continue this conversation. Mm. And it can be whoever they want to be, like, you know, the Dalai Lama for crying out loud. <laughs> you know, I, I don't need this conversation. Dalai Lama would probably be nice. <laughs> That's <laughs> my <No>. photo. <laughs> no, I mean, like, just don't be so fearful. Uh, if they are respecting you and they are giving you very harsh feedback and saying, hey, here's what you can improve. This is not working. This is what you need to be mindful of. This is that is your best friend for crying out loud. They want to help you so much. You know, so listen, listen, listen. Don't go into your ego and say like, but that is because, and this is because, and this is because. Mm -hmm. So just live your life, create what you want to create, do what you want to do. Don't mind anybody who's watching because the real conversation is happening inside your head. You're 24 hours you. So be on team you, mm -hmm. be on team you 24 hours. Cast a vote for for yourself, you know, vote for you, <laughs> just vote for you and, and just respect yourself with your inner dialogue and, and just really care for yourself because that's the, the most you can really have in your life. You know, this is the love without any conditions attached. This is what I talk about. The unconditional love, um, remove the conditions from your life and just live. Mm. That's what I'd like people to know. Such a powerful message and ending because we went like, I feel like we went the whole circle from like, you know, with self doubt and stage fright and being focused on what other people will think to this be on Team You and cast a vote for yourself. I really love this. I might order a t shirt with this, you know, <laughs> I'm on Team <laughs> I'm on Team Join me on my team. <laughs> it's a really, really lovely, lovely message to, to share. So thank you so much, Meta, for this. Maybe as a final question for from me to you, where could people, where could the audience get to to learn more from you and connect with you, if you would like? Well, to? yeah, I started this YouTube channel as well. Shaping Future Voices is the name of the channel. Uh, if you type in uh, Shaping Future Voices, you'll probably find a lot of things on the internet anyway. Um, so <laughs> this is a fresh channel. I would love to. I love for people to subscribe and you know just vote. <laughs> Or team me, I guess, in this sense. And then there's also the website, which is uh, Shaping Future Voices, obviously. Or you can find me as Mita Grushel also on LinkedIn and, um, and Facebook and places like that. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to everybody who wants to connect. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to link, of course, Meta's channel in the description so you can find it easily and go there and subscribe to her channel as well. And if you like this conversation and it helped you or you think it can help somebody else, of course, feel free to share. We create for the thing, for the world to benefit from it. So, yes. yes. Any questions to Meta? Write them also in the comments. I will make sure that she's going to get them and hopefully also respond. <laughs> And I'm so, so, so happy, Meta, that we had this conversation because I remember being so impressed with some things you said in Milan, like, you know, when you were part of this uh, public speaking panel with, uh, with talking about like overcoming the self-limitations and self-talk and like the rules to set with self-respect. And I'm so happy that now I have it also on my little corner of the internet <laughs> where I can, you know, revisit it. On, on a little bit worse day just to remind myself of all the all the positive energy and the empowerment that comes from this oh, thank you for your invitation thank you thank you so much